Okay, welcome to the John Gardena classroom. We have a super special guest with such wisdom and knowledge of over 43 years owning 14 different businesses. Aaron Walker is a man who literally walks the walk and talks the talk. He is a, a humble man, a great Christian man, a father, a grandfather, and he truly loves to just give his knowledge and wisdom to others. He is the president and founder of Iron Sharpens Iron, a mastermind group to help men excel in their life, business, personal, and spiritual life. So today, we want to welcome Aaron Walker and all the wisdom that he's going to share on our show today. So thank you so much for being on today, Aaron. Hey, John, I'm fired up, buddy. I couldn't sleep last night. I'm like, man, this is going to be a great time sharing with John and his audience. And uh, I'm just really humbled that you're having me on as your guest. So thank you. Well, we appreciate you being on today. And I know that the words of wisdom that you have to share with us today will resonate with uh, all these men who are listening to my show. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, you know, you have a great background in business. And one thing that I would like my audience to understand is how did you become financially secure and have that freedom? Yeah. You know, I don't know that we ever get totally secure. I think that's kind of a myth. I think yeah. we place our confidence and faith in the things that moth decays and destroys and rust withers away. Uh, we'll catch ourselves never being in a total spot of financial freedom, but we do have a little bit of financial success. And uh, I'll, I'll digress just for a minute. I'll take you way back. Uh, I was raised a really poor kid. My parents uh, lived in a 600 square foot house. There were four wow. children. My dad never made probably over $15,000 a year in my life. And uh, we later lost that house through bankruptcy. You know, you give $6,500 for a house and then we later lost it through bankruptcy. So I know all about being poor, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I mean, like I didn't grow up with a lot and fortunately met a couple of guys that had some investable resources and we formed a partnership when I was 18. I started my first business and then God really blessed it. Over the next nine or 10 years, when I was 27, we sold to a Fortune 500. And that was kind of the catalyst that gave me an opportunity to try other endeavors. And so God's really been good to us over the years. Uh, I want to take you to one pivotal point in my life, in my story, that really is where my journey truly began. It was August 1st, 2001. My life was amazing. Like yeah. uh, we lived in a big house. We had a vacation home. We had all the toys and, you know, we, we had all those things. Uh, I had left our church. It was a Wednesday morning. It was about seven, seven thirty in the morning. I'd left there to go to the office and got within a mile of my office. And uh, I ran over and killed a pedestrian that was crossing wow. the street. And man, even now telling that story, you know, uh, it brings back the memories. I can vividly see that happening. And, and I'm like, where in the world did that come from? Like it was a left hook, you know, it's yeah. like I was blindsided and a lot of pressure around that, a lot of counseling, a lot of coaching, a lot of, uh, peers getting around me to help me work through that journey. It took five years. Yeah. I sold the company. Um, I said, I've been chasing money since I was eight years old. You know, at the time I was 40 years old. I know you and I were talking pre-recording and you're 40 and mm -hmm. I was your age when this happened. I had two girls at home that were young teenagers and, uh, I didn't understand what was going on. And what I discovered through that five-year period, John, was that if it had been me that was killed that day, rather than me running over a pedestrian, like what would my legacy have been? And yeah. I started thinking about that. And my legacy would have been poor kid from Nashville, Tennessee, makes enough money to retire at age 27 and nobody cares. And I'm like, God help me. That is not what I want my legacy to be. I want my legacy to be, Hey, John's life, is better as a result of having known me. Like I help him with his goals and aspirations. I encourage him. I'm able to be a mentor, right? He can follow along and I help him dodge those landmines that I've been able to, to go through. And like, I want to be the giver, not the taker. Mm -hmm. And so I said, God, if you'll give me another chance, you know, I'll change the paradigm shift of my life. And so that's what we did. We started focusing outward rather than inward. And fast forward now over the past 20 years, God's given me the 
ability to be able to coach and encourage. Uh, when I turned 50, 11 years ago, Dave Ramsey and Dan Miller and Ken Abraham, some of those guys that live here in Nashville encouraged me to coach. Mm -hmm. So I started coaching, started doing podcast interviews, sharing my story to encourage other people. And God just opened the floodgates. And here we are today, you know, we're in five different countries around the world. We have 150 members in our mastermind groups. We have about 15 mastermind groups for the first time in four years, we're about to open three new groups awesome. and people are like, man, we want to be involved in that. And so we're excited to host iron sharpens iron mastermind and we're helping people grow personally, professionally, and spiritually. So if I heard you correctly, after this tragic incident that happened, you kind of had a, a period of humility and just deep, deep thinking about how can I have not only that legacy of who Aaron Walker is, but what impact could I have for others in their life? So it changed from the me factor to the outward servant factor. And what I love about that story is that you had a choice. You had a choice to make. And maybe if that never happened, you know, what would be your maybe legacy today? You think it'd be different, Aaron? Yeah, I do think it would be different. I think I would have probably lost my family. I was mm -hmm. on that track to lose my family because I was so focused on making money. It was just another retail outlet, another 50,000, get a bigger beach house, you know, a nicer car. Like, don't hear me wrong. I hate it when people with money go, money's not important. I want to go, you're a liar. It is important. Let's take it away from you and see how important it is. But I don't want money to be my God. Yeah. I don't want it to be my sole focus. And that was happening to me. And I came home with a pocket full of money to a house full of strangers. And mm -hmm. I'm like, uh, my wife's taking the girls to Girl Scouts and cheerleading practice and piano recitals. And I'm using the excuse, well, I'm providing for our family and I'm working late and longer hours. And what I did was, is I offered my family on the sacrifice altar of making more money. And, uh, I was providing well financially, but I didn't know my little girls and I didn't know my wife. And, uh, I think if I had, you know, continued on at that trajectory, uh, probably be divorced today. Yeah. Um, uh, probably wouldn't uh, have the close relationship that I do with my daughters. You know, what's the irony of that is my oldest daughter is the chief operating officer of our company and I get to Great. work with her daily. Yeah. Both of my girls live within 10 minutes of me. We get to see our grandchildren on a daily basis. We all worship together. We're a huge family now. And I think if I had stayed the other way, I wouldn't have all that. And so it's just a word of caution to those that are hearing me today that really evaluate what you're trying to accomplish, what is it that you're trying to achieve? And what I discovered through that, God did teach me some really valuable lessons is that money doesn't scratch the itch. Like you think it's going to, mm -hmm. and you think if I make just a little more money, then I'll be okay. And then what I did was I kept moving the bar. Well, like, yeah, I got this and now I can do that. And these things, if you're not careful, will take you away from your primary objective. And that's to be, you know, the husband God called you to be, the dad God called you to be, to be the giver, not the taker. And we get ourselves in bondage. We get these golden handcuffs because now we've leveraged ourselves to a point that we can't make a different decision. And so if you're in that position today, there is hope because you can work your way out of it, but you've got to first recognize it. Yeah. And I think that's one thing I would like everyone to hear is, from your story, um, I just keep hearing the word in my head, presence, being present. Mm -hmm. And wherever you spend your time is where your fruits come. Or if, so for example, if you were so focused on the money part that you were bearing fruit of wealth, but you have the neglection to your family. So what strategies, yeah. if you were um, a man in yeah. your 20s or 30s, sure. what sure. wisdom would you give them to say they're just starting off with their family or they're my age, 40, yeah. who has four kids, well, it's you, hard. What, yeah. What would be some sound yeah. advice and strategies you would say yeah. to have an impact on your family? Yeah. So I can give blanket suggestions, right? Mm -hmm. Without knowing your personal situation, 
I coach men all over the world. God's given me uh, the privilege of being able to coach entrepreneurs all over the world. And every scenario is not the same. You know, yeah. my dad used to say, let the tub set on its own bottom, right? We're, we're all different, right? We all have different circumstances. We all have different situations. But the truth of the matter is, is that there's a prioritization of priorities, yeah. And what we've got to do is really determine first what is important. Now, I hear guys say all the time, all oh, my family's important. Mm -hmm. Well, when you're spending 15 minutes a day with your family, your actions are screaming yeah. loudly what's important. Yeah. And what's important is, is that success, making a little more money, having a little more notoriety, puffing that ego up a little bit. Your pride gets in the way. You've got a little power. Uh, if I can look at your checkbook and tell what's important to you, mm. right? That's true. And so that's painful. That's painful, you know, but we want to sound right. We want to make the right comments. But when you say your family's priority and you're tipping your hat to them and there's 15 minutes of meaningful conversation with your family a day, that doesn't really tell me that that's priority. Right. Yeah. And so I think you've got to first make the determination is your family the most important or is it your job? Mm -hmm. Now, here's the tough part like, it's expensive to live today, right? Yeah. Education is expensive. Automobiles are expensive. Homes are expensive. They're escalating at a cost that is phenomenal. I wished I had made even more real estate investments 40 years ago, you know, it's like, yeah. I'd be a really, really, really wealthy guy today. And it's hard, man, it is so hard today. But what you've got to do as a family unit is sit down and decide, what do I want? Actually, if your listeners are interested, I'll even give you a copy of a document that I created called that. What do I want? Yeah. Robin and I have elected to live proactively, not reactively. So Social media has really heightened our awareness to how our peers and colleagues are living. And then we become very disenchanted by the way we live, because what we're seeing is this four hour work week on the beach. My life is great, but they don't see the reality of what some of those things are. They don't really know the plagues that they have and the propensity to chasing things, the shiny objects. And see, we don't have full perspective. All we yeah. see is the glamour shots, right? And then we become disenchanted with our own lives. You're never going to win that game. What you've got to do is turn off a lot of those things and you've got to sit privately with your family. If it's just your spouse, you don't have any children and say, Hey, I heard this guy they call big A was talking <laughs> about living a life being proactive. Like, where do I want to live? Uh, what kind of car do I want to drive? How much money do I want to give away? How much money is adequate for me to live the life that I want to live? Uh, how can I really be the influencer in our community? How can I be, you know, the man or the woman that God called me to be? Like, what's hindering us? And like, are these things really important? And not take other people's objectives and impose them on your personal life, right? We're never going to win doing that. We're never going to win the comparison. There's people that are way ahead of me. There's people that I'm way ahead of, you know, and oftentimes we'll compare our beginning to their middle or our beginning to their end. And it's just not a fair comparison. So be careful not to go down that path. You know, there, this is kind of a silly analogy, but I'll give yeah. it to you. Like I've got a boat, I enjoy fishing. That's my hobby. Uh, mm -hmm. Matter of fact, fish for 35 years in tournaments. And so I'm really good on the lake. And I yeah. say that with humility, but I am. I mean, I bass fish all these tournaments. Well, I've got a 15 foot boat that is 21 years old that serves my purpose well. And I don't say this being, you know, bodacious, but I could go buy any boat I wanted mm -hmm. without a question. And if I listen to other people, big, A, want you to replace this boat. I like this boat and this boat serves its purpose. I don't allow other people to should on me, right? It's like, <laughs> well, you can afford it just because you can afford it. Don't mean you it could should. do it. Yeah. We live in a very modest house, but it's nice, mm -hmm. but I could go buy a house. That's three times the value of this one, if not more, but I'm not living my life for other people. I'm living my life for Robin and I, yeah. right? 
And I don't allow that peer pressure. Like I enjoy the life I'm living. So we've got to work through that. So really identify what it is that you want. Where do you want to live? What is the lifestyle that you're trying to accomplish? And here's a big question. Why are you trying to make more money? Like, what are you going to do with it? What's the plan? Yeah. Just to make more, to have more is not a good plan. Yeah. And you'll get caught in that trap. So just be very mindful of how you're living your life and live proactively. Yeah. And I think for, for everyone, I mean, for me personally, my wife and I had the same conversation is what do we want for our children? How can we serve our, our children and our family better? Cause we, same thing, we could, we could have a house that's twice as much as what sure. it, our, the value is of our house right now. But why would we want to be financially let's strap to a mortgage? The borrower right? servant to the lender or, or yeah, or a servant to the lender. Cause you know, I see people who are in their in their 60s who still have a mortgage and it blows my mind. And I think to myself, you're working for, I wouldn't, I don't know if I'd use the phrase or word comfort, but why are you serving your only your needs? So what I hear you say, Aaron, is or big A is, you know, what do I want? So as a family man, as a father, and as a husband, what do I want is that that relational peace with you and your wife and your children, if you have children, and what, what vision do you have, right? It has to have, you have to have that vision of what you both want. And then you start working out together on a plan to have purpose. Would you agree with that? 100%. There's got to be a level of success. And I want to stay there for a minute because I would be so irritated if I was a listener sitting on the other end, 25, 30, 40 years old going, yeah, he, he's got all these things. It's easy for him to say that, right? Mm -hmm. There was a huge expense associated with that related to almost losing my family. Uh, there was, I've been married 42 years. Not all those have been happily married mm -hmm. uh, because of my arrogance and my pride and my desire for power, my desire for recognition, uh, there was a huge cost associated with those things. Now I wouldn't change a lot of things because I enjoy having a nice house. I enjoy having a nice car. We take our family on vacation. I don't have to make a decision. Hey, can we afford to go out and eat tonight? We go out and eat, right? Those things are fun. So I don't want in any way to demotivate your audience in any regard, because those things are fun. Mm -hmm. It's also fun to be able to get those letters from people saying, I'm going on a missions trip. And I'm like, yeah, man, here, here's a grand here. Take that. Hopefully that'll help you. Or church does a project. Yeah. I can stroke a check and go toward Like that feels good, right? It feels yeah. good to be able to do those things. So in no way do I want to say that money's a bad thing, but keep it in the right perspective. Like, cause there is a cost associated with your ambitions. And so just be mindful of what it is. Here's the thing. If you're going to cheat somebody, cheat the office, cheat your job because they don't have a memory, you can make more money. You got one go through with your family. You get one chance. And what's going to happen is those kids are going to grow up. They're going to get a car. And by the time they're 16 or 17, basically you're pretty done with them being at home. You can't make up missing their all-star baseball game. You can't make up missing their graduation. You can't make up missing you fill in the blank. You cannot make that up. You can't get that back. And you can make more money. You can have more colleagues and peers, right? So what I'm saying is, is get your focus correct in the places that you're not going to lay there as a 70 or 80 year old person on your deathbed and go, man, I really hate that I did this and I hate that I missed this. And I hate, see, here's what's going to happen. And I hope I'm alarming a few people right now. What's going to happen is, is when you don't have time for your kids, they're going to find that relationship somewhere. They're going to yeah. find it with somebody. They're starving to death for attention. They're going to get attention. It may not be in a way you like. And then what's going to happen, you're going to come to your realization at some point and you're going to go, okay, Billy, now I'm ready. He's going to say, sorry, dad, yeah. like I'm busy now. I got a life of my own. And then you're going to be like, I can't get it back. And see that breaks my heart. I don't want that to happen to people today. So 
That's the reason that we've gone on this mission saying, Hey, just wake up, just pay attention. Just know what the cost is associated with this success. And for me, the tagline in my book is I can teach you to live a very successful, but significant life simultaneously. There's a significance piece that we're missing because all of our energy and our focus is on more, bigger, better, shinier, faster. Yeah. And then you get it. And it's kind of like the dog that caught the car. Now he doesn't know what to do with it. And then you find out this is really not giving me the satisfaction. I thought it was going to give me when we lose sight of meaning and purpose. See, that's what gets me out of bed. Mm -hmm. Like I like to make a little bit more money. Like, I don't want to say that some of the money is not a motivation, but when I'm seeing transformational experiences in the lives of the members that I'm coaching and teaching, and then their spouse says, Hey, you're a better dad. Now you're a better husband. Now you don't abuse the substance anymore. You know, pornography is not a part of your life anymore. You're involved in your community. You've got a much better handle on the balance in your life. Like, see, for me, that's what gets me out of bed, those transformational experiences. So for you, you've got to find what that is and you've got to balance that in your life so that you live this life in its entirety and that you're living the whole person. Oh, that's beautiful, Aaron. I really do appreciate that. So we're right about halfway through the show and I want to take you to recess. So in the John Gardena classroom, I'm just going to ask you a couple of questions. Just tell me the first thing that comes to your head. They're very simple. You'll pass this test easily. All right, ready? Question number one. Who was your favorite teacher? Judy Bell, seventh grade English teacher. I had the hardest time in that class, but she really cared about me. Judy yeah. Bell. Awesome. I love the word care because that's a staple of how I live. Commit, attitude, respect, and effort. And you know it when you see it. Okay, next one. Um, favorite mentor? Bob Warren, Hardin, Kentucky. Basic training was the name of his company. Uh, all-star basketball player, eight-year pro basketball player. He accepted Christ when he was 27, changed his life. He devoted the remainder of his life to pouring into men and mentoring them. Hands down, without a question, Bob Warren. That's great. Okay, favorite place to visit? Favorite place to visit, man. I have a lot of favorite know, places to visit. <laughs> you know, I, it's, it's a series of places, but I can tell you this, Robin and I have been on more cruises than we can count. Mm -hmm. And so my favorite place to visit is a cruise ship. I don't I, even care where it's going. <laughs> I don't think anybody will say that one again. And, uh, Aaron, that's, that's a great response to that one. Okay. How about your favorite meal? Yeah. Coconut shrimp. Hmm. Nice. And dessert. Key lime pie. Oh, that's so good. That's <laughs> I may so go good. eat after I get off. <laughs> I know time. it's so good. Both those are terrific. And last one is a, a favorite book that you think everyone needs to read. Yeah. I got to give a couple here. I can't give just okay, one. Yeah. yeah. How to win friends and influence people should be required reading before you get out of school. Uh, Donald Miller wrote a new book called who not how, mm -hmm. uh, that is probably a transformational book. Uh, if I had read that book 30 years ago, uh, I would be 30 times better off financially than I am today. So wow. who not how that's powerful. Well, Aaron, Hey, we're ending our recess now. We're jumping back into the classroom. And we're going to finish on the subjects of faith. And then we're going to talk deeply about how important it is to have an accountability partner and in, in being mentored. So let's start with faith. Tell, tell us how faith plays a pivotal role in your life daily. Yeah, it doesn't play a place yeah. in my life. Uh, it, it is my life. Mm -hmm. It's not a part. It's my faith is in its entirety. People ask me all the time, how do you separate, you know, your work life from your professional life, from your personal life? And how do you segregate your faith from not integrating that into, you know, discussions, you know, within the community? And I said, you don't, mm -hmm. because I don't, I don't want to. Yeah. 
Yeah. I don't want it to be a part. I want it to be everything. I want it to be the filter for every decision I make, the way I live, the way I interact with my family, the way I interact on this call. I don't practice it perfectly, right? I'm a sinner, saved by grace, right? Yes, and sir. so, yeah, I'm fallible just like all of us. But the truth is, is that it is the most important thing in my life. Uh, above my wife, above my children, above all those things. And so it does, it doesn't play a part. It is. And here's what I shared with a young man recently. He was at my house visiting. He's from Dubai. Mm -hmm. He was in iron sharpens iron, our mastermind. And I was talking to him one day and I said, uh, do you do and say the same things regardless of who it is that you're talking to? He said, what do you mean? I said, do you watch the same things on TV? when your spouse is there and when she's not, do you drink the same things around me as you do somebody else? Do you smoke the same things around me? Do you tell the same jokes regardless of who's in the room? Uh, like, do you live your life that way? And he said, no. And I said, uh, that would be exhausting yeah. to me not to live that way. It, it's just so much easier to be you. And if you allow God to sift through the outcome, and you just do what you're supposed to, it's a lot more relaxed way of living our lives. You know, I, I agree with that. And I was on a, um, an episode yesterday, um, Selling with Dignity, a podcast. And one thing, Aaron, that he told me was because he follows me on social media. He's like, you're one of the few people that are bold about your faith. And he asked, why do you think a lot of people are afraid to, to show that they're a Christian? And I, I'll be honest, I think a lot of people aren't authentic because they're afraid of what people think of them. If yeah. Say, well, here's the thing. Yeah. yeah. This is a good conversation for a second. So here's the thing is that, uh, we can, we can know who Christ is intellectually. Mm -hmm. There's a vast difference in making him Lord. Yeah. And so you've got to get to a place in your life to where, it's not about you and what people think of you. Like, like I didn't write the manuscript. Okay. Like take that up with God, right? I've got to decide, do I really trust him? Do I really believe that the Bible is the inerrant word of God that I'm going to model my life after? Do I really believe that Jesus is who I'm trying to emulate and be? I will never measure up, but is that the goal? And so I had to make a decision in my life that, no, he's Lord above all, like your opinion, the way you view me, the things you say. Here's the other thing. You know, we had this interesting discussion the other day. People were talking about sharing the gospel. They said, yeah. ah, you need to build a relationship first. You need to get to know them. And I said, I disagree with that. And they said, well, I don't want to be that guy standing on the street corner. I don't either. I don't want to do that. But I do want to be able to just share what I feel outwardly, because if you say I've got to build a relationship first, I got to get to know them first, then you're saying some of my actions have uh, involvement in them accepting Christ. And it doesn't. Christ draws you to himself. Our responsibility is to share. That's what God said. Be a disciple, share, and I'll take care of the rest. He didn't say build a relationship first. Mm -hmm. He didn't put a caveat in there. He said, when you feel that you should share, share. You know, if you mock me or laugh at me or, well, that's on you. That's not on me. And so quit trying to separate it. Quit trying to be politically correct. Quit straddling the fence. Scripture even teaches us, you know, not to be lukewarm. Oh yeah. And when you're straddling the fence, we're being lukewarm. Now don't go out here and be obnoxious and abrasive. Jesus didn't do that either. Right. Hmm. All he did was ask questions. And so we need to share, we need to ask good questions, we need to love, and we need to trust the outcome to him. Oh, beautifully said. No, I just, one of the reasons why um, I wrote my book, Freedom to Ascend, this is not a plug-in for my book, it's just about how I operate in life, is I work in a public school setting, and people ask me, like, how can you show your faith in a public school setting? It's simple. I simply imitate Christ. And if I could do that with love, servant leadership, and showing them 
how the heart of God really operates the best I can, then I'm showing them how to be a, a true Christian. So you don't have to say, I mean, in this, I'm saying in the school setting, but I love, I, you do have to be authentic. And I love the conversation you had with the gentleman from Dubai is you should be that character of who you are all the time right. and not have to worry about like, I'm with these people now. So I have to be different. I have to eat different, drink different, say things differently. Right. Character is the one piece that all of us need to have a hundred percent of the time. And people resonate with that because it's authentic. Yeah. It's so yeah. authentic. And um, so we need people in our lives. Um, we need people in our lives asking us the hard questions. Yeah. See, we, we're designed to be in community. We're not designed mm -hmm. to be in isolation. And we need people around us on a regular basis. And oftentimes I quote, you know, um, that isolation is the enemy of excellence. And if you really want to excel in your life and really go far, you've got to go together. You can go you fast do. going alone, but if yeah. you're going to go further, then you've got to go with community. And I need people calling me out. I need accountability partners for 30 years. Every week I meet with three guys that I share my life with that ask me the tough questions that ask me, how's your thought life? How are you treating Robin? How are yeah. you showing up for your kids, your grandkids? Are you being honorable? Are you doing anything you would be afraid for me to ask? Are you doing anything in private? You would be afraid if light was shown on that. And I'm like, man, it really helps me walk kind of the line through the week. Cause I know I'm going to be asked these questions and, See, I subject myself to that scrutiny of other people because I want to get better. Yeah, I don't want to be in that isolation. And so it's just all what we're desirous of in living that life. Well, this is perfect because this is bringing to the last subject that I want to talk about is, is that mentorship piece. And, you know, I have learned um, being a coach for 20 years now that the only way to get better as a coach is to learn from experts in the field. Mm -hmm. And to be better, not only as a coach of a sport or of leadership um, in all areas of your life, you want to excel in all areas of your life. So talk about whether it's specifically your program, Iron Sharpens Iron, or your accountability group, how important it is to have at least one person in your life who's towing the line with you to ask those right questions to make you a better person. And how could someone find someone like that? Yeah. Years ago, I went into a mastermind group. This has been 25 years ago, almost. And, uh, I made a comment about, I don't like to read. And the guy said, I don't care if you like to read or not. You don't just wake up smarter. I mean, you're <laughs> going to have to read. And, and I'm like, dang, well, now I'm an avid reader. I've read thousands and thousands of books and spend probably 10% of my income annually on coaching on yeah. shoring up you know, areas of weakness and conferences and listening to Ted talks and podcasts and reading blogs and reading books and leveling up. Right. I don't want to coast. I don't want to be a neutral. You know, I brought home a C one time on my report card and uh, my mom got all over me and I said, what is the deal? I mean, that's average. And mm -hmm. she goes, yeah, average. You're just as close to the bottom as you are at the top mm -hmm. and you're above average. You can do better than this. Right. And I was like, yeah. And she pushed me along. See, we need people every day pushing us to be above average. Listen, life can be adventuresome. We only got one go through on this side of heaven. Why do you not want to maximize that time? Why don't you want to be best at whatever your craft is? You know, we have core values here at Iron Sharpens Iron. My number one core value is relationships matter most. My second core values, make it amazing. If you're going to do it, I mean, do it right. Don't halfway do it. My third core value is no excuses. I hate excuses. I don't want to hear excuses. It's like, no, you didn't really want to do it. My fourth core value is everything is figure outable. And that's a word. Look it up. Everything yeah. <laughs> is figure outable. And then finally, my fifth core value is truth before opinion. And for me, truth is God's word. That's where I find my identity. And when you have those core values, you can run every decision through those core values and ask yourself, am I making it amazing? Am I just throwing out an excuse? Can I really figure this out? And you can't do that alone. See, we can't see our blind spots. It wouldn't be a blind spot if you could that's see right. it. You know, that's what's going to trip you up. 
And I want to have people in the wings all the time asking me to level up, to bring me to a higher standard, right? And when you subject yourself to that level of scrutiny, and then you have the consensus of the multitudes of people around you that really love you and care for you and walk with you, that's what we do in Iron Sharpens Iron. We've built a brotherhood, quite honestly. It's a community, and it's guys leveling up every single day. Better husbands, better dads, doubling, tripling their income, growing their businesses, building boundaries to where they're home at a certain time, stopping pornography, stopping alcohol abuse, and they're leveling up physically, emotionally, spiritually, they're leveling up. And so for me, it's everything having somebody else in my corner. Man, that's, that's powerful because I have learned the same thing, Aaron, that you have to have the right people. And I always call them like in your, in your corner. And the reason why is because you can't do this alone. And you no. looked at the way the, the model Jesus set up with his 12 disciples, you know, it's a beautiful model. Like whenever they went to a town, they would go in pairs. They would always go in pairs. So how do we think we should go in isolation in this life? And it's so hard that the, the evil that's out there and you let the devil creep in your mind that you can't do things. You have doubt, isolation because of isolation. And we know that when we surround ourselves with good men and women, OK, mm-hmm. who have strong character and they want to see they literally truly love to see you get better because they care and love for you. Man, that's powerful. That yeah. is so powerful. And and can you tell us one, maybe just one incident of a, a member from Iron Sharpens Iron that just resonated with you or still does um, and how, how important it was in that person's life? Oh, man, there are hundreds I, I know, of examples, I, <laughs> right? There's so many. Like, how in the world do you pick one, one example? I, but I'll, th- I'll give you this quick example. We had a guy, his name's Brian, and uh, Brian came to us, filled out an application, and I called him. I interview everybody, and I called him, and I said, uh, man, from the looks of this application, you can't afford lunch, much mm-hmm. less to get into the mastermind. Mm-hmm. And uh, everybody calls me Big A. He said, Big mm-hmm. A, he said, I'm going to be honest with you. He said, I don't have another choice. I've tried everything. I've exhausted everything. And I'm living in my dad's basement with my wife and my children. He said, so technically you could say I'm homeless. And he said, I, it, obviously, I would be more successful if I knew what to do. I don't know what to do and I need help. Yeah. And I almost didn't let him in. I was like, I don't know, man. Like this is take, he goes, listen, I I need in. So he got in. So let's fast forward five years. He owns a construction company. He has 60 employees now. Wow. He and another ISI brother just bought the building he's in for $750,000. His marriage has never been better. His two daughters are married now that he had at that time. And he is living the dream. He just took a six week sabbatical. He was able to take off. And I'm like, and he says, there's no way I could have done this alone. I was homeless in my dad's basement (laughs) as a married guy with two kids. And now He's got a company with 60 employees. I could tell you story after story after story like that. And he is one of our biggest advocates. You know, we had two other guys real quick. I'll tell you a quick story. They're brothers. One of them's 31. One of them's 33. One of them was a highway patrolman. The other one was in the mortgage lending business. And they said they wanted to buy a couple of houses. So they got together three years ago. They bought three houses, rental houses. Yeah. They wanted to grow that, but they didn't know how they got in the mastermind group. So let's fast forward 36 months, their mastermind group taught them how to scale that business. They just bought their 280th house. They're on track to buy 200 houses this year. There's other ISI brothers that are funding the project because they built the trust. Mm -hmm. They learned how to scale. Their goal now is to buy 200 houses this physical year. Wow. And they didn't know how I just spent two days with them going over their program. And he said, big A, I attribute all of our success to iron sharpens iron because we didn't know how to scale. We didn't know how to raise resources. We didn't know how to build systems and processes. And today they've built a multi-million dollar organization 36 months ago. One of them worked for the highway patrol and the other one was doing mortgage lending. And so what I'm saying is, is that, they didn't know what they didn't know. Yeah. And when you get around people that are of like mind, that align with your core values, 
We now is everybody doing that? Absolutely not. There's yeah. no way everybody's going to do that. But listen, you got a fighting chance when you surround yourself with trusted advisors that are unbiased that will tell you the truth. And so, yeah, maybe it is a huge plug for iron sharpens iron, but we're touching hundreds of people all over the world, radical lives being changed in ways I've never seen before. And if you're interested, you're, you're hearing this, reach out to me at viewfromthetop.com. View with a V view from, I have the Southern draw, so nobody understands yeah. <laughs> you from the top.com and check us out, uh, schedule a time. Let's talk and let's see if we can get you in and help you out. Well, Aaron, I truly appreciate your time today. You are just a blessing to everyone who had this opportunity to listen to this episode. And um, just thank you for sharing wisdom. I think yeah. what you said is the pivotal point in your life. And after 2001, as you learn, it's not about me, but about giving. And now you have given to so many men around the world now to have them unleash their potential to be just great individuals because we're all children of God. God has all given us great gifts, but many of us don't use them because we don't know how we don't have the wisdom or support or fellowship to just start moving that ball forward. So you had so many great opportunities to share with stories um, in your own personal life. And I'm just so appreciative of you being on today. Yeah, John, I really enjoyed it, buddy. Thank you. You've made me feel warm and invited and, um, uh... I really enjoyed our time. So thank you. Wow. Thank you, Aaron. And this is the end of the Gardena classroom.